Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Debbie. And uh, I just... To, I've had many people thank me for coming down here and uh, so forth, but let me thank you for being here. I mean, nobody I saw drug in, hogtied, roped, nothing. Everybody came in on their free will, nobody by the ear. I mean, thank you for bringing your enthusiasm and interest in wanting to learn about the concepts. And, and that is a big part of any kind of learning is that we want to learn about them. Um, and I want to, of course, thank Linda and the immense committee and everybody's commitments and all that you've done to make this happen. It takes a lot of work on everybody's part, more than just the speakers. So I thank you for making this happen. And I am excited about being here. And um, some of you might wonder, you know, what do the concepts have to do with staying sober and helping drunks? Uh, or you might think, well, that concept stuff, that's just a bunch of politics, a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo for those people. Well, my task is to try to demystify them, like Linda said. Try and make them sound like English, okay? And how they are all interconnected with each other. And like when we did the traditions last year, maybe get a glimpse of how they actually can be personally applied in our AA life, our professional lives, our homes. You know, and, and I think that as we walk through those, you'll begin to see some of that. There's a story that's been around a long time that really signifies the importance of all three legacies. We have the legacy of recovery, which is our first one. Our second is unity, which is the 12 traditions. And the third is the service, which is the 12 concepts. And this story goes that it, apparently a young man had just made his first year of sobriety. And he went to his sponsor, who was a dairy farmer, to complain about the behavior of some of the members of his home group. And he fretted that they wasted valuable meeting time with useless discussions of traditions and one actually had the audacity to talk about concepts, whatever those are. How can I convince them, he asked his sponsor, to concentrate on the one and only important thing, recovery? His sponsor didn't say a word, but he simply led the young man to the milking barn. He picked up a three-legged milking stool and removed two of the legs. Here, sit on this. Um, I'm going to fall off. I know. But sit on it anyway. And, of course, he did, and he tinkers off of it. The sponsor replaced one of the legs. Sit on it now. And so he he stayed on it a little bit better, but a little precariously. And then he replaced the third leg, and once again the sponsor sat on a solid perch. He said, the three legs of that stool are like the three legacies handed down to us by the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. All three legacies are necessary if we're going to sit comfortably. So the next time someone discusses the traditions or the concepts, pay attention. And so that's a little visual, and I know that I work very well with visuals. And um, so the first thing we're going to do is kind of take a look at what are some of the pieces of literature that we're talking about here. So I know many of you brought books. You might have bought a service manual. You might have picked up some of the other things. So here's where, um, I, let me just say, I'm, just not, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? <laughs> I really do have sources. They're verifiable. My examples might be, you know, certainly not written down because I will have different examples based on experience. But what we're talking about first and foremost is this book, The Current color until they come out with the next one because this is issued every year okay and so this this is a small version i prefer the large print not necessarily because my eyes are getting worse but you know kind of but anyway um (laughs) it makes it easier to make notes is what i like to say and so it's there's two booklets basically put into one the first half of this is the aa service manual which will review 
we're not doing this tonight, but it will review with you each of the different steps of service structure uh, that we have of different positions that people can have. Combined with the 12 Concepts of World Service by Bill W. That's in the back half of the book. So this is the Bible for a GSR, anyone in service. This really is your go-to manual. Another piece of fabulous literature that they've come up with is the 12 Concepts Illustrated. Again, provides pictures and all that. I love that, okay? So this is such a wonderfully done, designed, real simplistic. It doesn't give you details. It just kind of explains what those concepts are. Like the traditions, there's also a concepts checklist. A checklist is almost like a little inventory of, you know, am I doing this? Am I aware of this regarding each of those concepts? So there's actually a checklist for them. And then the real geeks of the world, like myself, um, have uh, the final general service conference report. Again, issued every year. Uh, the conference is held in April. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is. The actions, decisions, the events that happen are printed in box 459 as a quick summary right after the conference is over. But this is the final that goes to print. This is where I have gotten a lot of my numbers. So this is the verifiable source of the numbers that we'll be sharing tonight. I define an AA geek as anyone who cries while reading this conference report, <laughs> which is me. So I love that thing. And so then we also have... The 12 Concepts in Window Shade form, which thank you, Ray, for making those possible to be seen. A couple years ago, um, uh, my husband said to me, I have a, a Christmas gift for you. You're just going to die. No one, no one will ever probably get this as a gift. Well, you know how your imagination goes. <laughs> that was my Christmas gift. <laughs> And I told him, he's right, you know, that uh, no one will ever get that as a Christmas gift. <laughs> but that's our house, you know, and uh, we are definitely on the same page. Okay. As I mentioned before, I love pictures. I learn better like that. I mean, I know that the service manual is not a, a piece of literature or book that you will curl up with a cup of cocoa and a fire and read. I know that. So we've taken that out, and, and hopefully, you, but you will become interested in taking a look a little bit further into it after tonight. So you all have this yellow handout. Let's turn to the first page of the picture, the Cathedral of Spirit. A friend of mine did this sketch for me because in 1954, in numerous talks, Bill said that he called our structure in society the AA Cathedral of Spirit. He said the 12 steps, which we've done 12 of those leading to the floor, the 12 steps are what we stand on with a floor that is ever expanding to include all who come here. The 12 traditions are the buttresses of insurance that our walls won't fall. So we have 12 columns. And that the 12 concepts are the spire of service, creating a beacon to shine throughout the world for all to see, and that may its symbolic finger continue to point straight upward toward God. And those are his words on the designing what this whole structure is. We need all parts of that. Once again, our recovery is made up of 36 principles, not just 12. I know many of you, as Linda mentioned earlier, you're going to have questions and stuff. Please note them as we go along, and I might be answering them, you know, as we go on the talk tonight, but definitely after the break will be time for question and answer. And I don't know if there's a basket for silent questions, 
or you can ask them from the floor too. There is this basket for silent. How many of you have ever been a general service representative? Great. How many of you have been a district committee member? Okay. How many of you have been a delegate? How about a trustee? Okay. These are some of the levels of service responsibility. Doesn't necessarily mean you get a better parking place or better seat at the restaurant. It just means more responsibility. That's all. And those are, of course, service commitments we take which are non-paid. Our expenses may be reimbursed because it would be unfortunate to only pick people who could afford to do the traveling or the overnight stays at area assemblies or whatever the, this area does. But we certainly want to be represented. And this is really what we're talking about tonight, your voice. Um, the third legacy manual is really a document of procedure, kind of a how-to manual. And our service structure, guided by the concepts, was created to bridge the gap between our general service trustees and the fellowship. And additionally, it has put in enough checks and balances so that no one area has more power or gets out of control. Everybody, everybody has someone or a group to be accountable to. Now, I know we did a timeline, kind of a thorough timeline last time on the tradition, so I'm not going to, like, go into AA history. That's not what this talk is about. But I want to show you how they came about. It wasn't just one day, bored, twiddling thumbs. Hey. Let's put a structure together. You know, no, it was never like that. So let's turn the page in your handout. And it starts with Bill Wilson getting sober. And that led to, we know that story of going to Akron and Bob got sober in 1935. In 1938, about 40 people are sober. There are almost twice as many people in the room tonight sober than there were in 1938. And at that time, they were already thinking about us because they were thinking about the service structure and getting going global in a way. So on August 11th of 1938, they created the Alcoholic Foundation as a trusteeship. To begin, and they began taking care of our finances and our public relations and, and, and um, uh, things like that. So they're thinking big, uniform literature. In the, for the year 2006, they sold over 1 million big books of all the different sizes and editions. Over one, and that's one year. That's just one year. They're thinking about public relations, answering pleas for help, aiding new groups, and providing experience. And again, in 2006, we have a total of 58,539 registered groups in the U.S. and Canada. Crossing international boundaries, we have 58 general service offices around the world in 180 countries. Recovery is blooming. We have our monthly magazine, which is called The Grapevine. And in 2006, the average monthly subscriptions were over 103,000. Now, all these numbers are listed there for you. And the translation of literature, this is what I always love to find out. In 2006, they had translated our big book into 59 languages. I don't know how many pieces of literature would get that. Maybe Gone with the Wind would get translated, <laughs> you know. Just a guess, but um, uh, but our big book is in 59 languages. Recovery, the disease is in every language, and recovery is growing in that way too. In 1939, the book Alcoholics Anonymous is published, and it contains our 12 steps, which is our first legacy. Membership at that time is about 100. Some say there was 79, but 100 sound better. You know, we, we like better. And uh, 1940, the membership had grown. Look at from approximately 100-ish, the book is published. Now we're about 2,000. And next year, in 1941, when the Saturday Evening Post article hits, we boom from 2,000 to 8,000 by year end. Whoa. That is growth. And there, it's coming in fast and furious and calls and pleas and writing. And they are... There's just not been anything like this. 
And over and over in my mind, I think about how this came about. There was no template for our service structure. There wasn't anything to copy or to start from and then tune it to suit us. It, this, this was an amazing vision of our founders, especially Bill, especially Bill. In um, 1946, the grapevine proposes what would become our traditions, but the original article presented to the fellowship, Bill used the grapevine a lot to launch and communicate. And he called them, and I like to, to bring this up because sometimes when we get, when we say the traditions, we think of, we get kind of, um, you know, flat. But when he proposed them, he called them an Alcoholics Anonymous tradition of relations, 12 points to assure our future. Uh, that just, for me, it pops off the page with what he's really presenting. So you and I will be able, there will be an Alcoholics Anonymous when you and I come here. There in 47, there was a memo from Bill to the trustees with a proposal to create this yearly conference. Because early on, once again, Bill saw the need. He's got to connect this board of trustees that nobody really knows about who's basically running our business. And right now, it kind of ends with, with he and Bob. But, you know, they, they're perishable. They're not going to live forever. So how is he going to connect those AAs out there that he wants to have run their own society and this small group which is able to do that? How is he going to do that? Well, he proposes this conference. In July of 1950, we have our first international convention in Cleveland. We're five years old. Excuse me, 15 years old. The regist- just a side note, the registration for that conven- conference, uh, international convention was $1.50. In, 19- in 2005 in Toronto, it was $85. And I read that the conference, that international convention literally had a 1% loss, which they considered a great break even. It was, it's not about a money maker. Their goal is break even. And the financials on that were a 1% loss. They were thrilled that they, you know, it came out there. The traditions at that conference were unanimously adopted. Now we've got our second legacy of unity. He proposed to that body of 120,000 people. I mean, not that there were 120 there, but the population of AA at that time was guesstimated at 120,000 about this yearly conference. And we're going to start it next year. And we're going to give this a five-year trial to see how this all works out. Now, he was fought those years, those prior three years. He did, he was fought by good friends who were trustees, advisors. He, it was not like, oh, Bill fought it, we do it. No, it it was not that way. He stood on the firing line alone a lot of times. When the, with the traditions, they didn't want rules. Well, they're not rules. They assured our future. And then the concepts were going to bridge a big gap. So in in November of that year, Dr. Bob died. So now he's really, of course, seeing more and more this need. In April of 51, the Panel 1 delegates came to New York. How they picked the first panel was that one delegate from each of the 27 states and provinces of the largest AA populations sent somebody. And he said once, you know, they came in and they asked questions and they reviewed our finances and how about this? And he says, as I sat back and watched all this happening, I knew Alcoholics Anonymous was safe, even from me, because he knew his own self and his weaknesses and his ego and the whole scam, the whole gamma, not scam, gamma of it. But he saw This was what he wanted. He wanted Alcoholics Anonymous to start taking responsibility for itself. In the second year, the panel two delegates came in, and those were then the remaining 28 states and provinces. And from the larger populations, they got an extra representation. And so there we began the (laughs) two-year delegate rotation. So when you have... When you hear someone say, I'm on panel such and such, your delegate, for example, 
they will identify the numbered panel of their first one. So for example, our delegate was elected in, the, on, in 2006, which began her term January 107. She was on panel 57. Even though she will go to panel 58, she will always identify herself as a member of panel 57. The delegate who starts this year, excuse me, next year in 2008 as their first year will identify as panel 58 delegate. So just a little bit of what those numbers mean when you hear them, that was the num first year of their s delegate service was the panel that they went to. In 54, the Alcoholic Foundation name was changed to the General Service Board, mainly because they felt the word foundation kind of implies charity and paternalism and big money. And that's, that's, that, that was good when we started. But now that we're growing and we're really becoming our own and we are self-supporting, we're not, we don't want nor are we inviting outside funds. We're not going to go there. And so we changed the name. The second international was in 1955 in St. Louis. And here was another turning point in our history. The fifth General Service Conference, we've said that the first four, they were in New York. This is the only time the General Service Conference before and after has ever been outside of New York and not in April. It was held at the same time preceding the, Gen the International Convention there. And it was there that having it done the fifth year, they knew that we could take responsibility for ourselves, that this experiment now had certainly been successful. It was at that time that we got, we were, the responsibility was turned over to the General Service Conference would now replace the co-founders. And so the trustees would hear from the voice, not of the co-founders, but of the conference, which is fed from the fellowship's representation. And so this became the middle ground uh, connecting us. In 1957, the legal bylaws of the board were created. In 62, the concepts, Bill finally finished writing those. That was one of his last, you know, big duties. He finished those, and our official third legacy of service was, was created. And over the years, the, the service manual and the 12 concepts, they've been in separate pamphlets together, separate together, separate. And I think having them together really is, and it's been together now for many years, but they used to be in two separate things. And then there is actually a short form of the concepts, which is what is on the window shade. So those were done in 74. At the 1963 General Service Conference, Bill says, but it is your responsibility to the future. You have to face the fact that leadership is not a question always of espousing popular opinions or causes. There comes a few times when your responsibility is such and convinced that your station gives you a wider vision than others have the advantage of, then you must stand alone. In fact, this standing alone is expressed in the concepts where there is such a concern for minorities and their rights and how often they can be right, and this also applies to a minority of one. At important turning points in the history of AA, it has become my lot to stand in those lonely positions. I am glad I was given those chances and that no grievous error resulted. Thank God. And I say thank God, too, for Bill's commitment to stand for what he believed, what he saw, what he envisioned as the direction and the right thing to keep us together so there would be an Alcoholics Anonymous for you and I today. The concepts are the only piece of conference-approved literature with a byline saying by Bill W. The concepts, as he would say over and over, are really an expansion of the second tradition. And that says, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Because many of you will be hearing this for the first time, all I want to do is provide a snapshot of each of these concepts. I mean, I got examples and stories on all of them, but we're not going to do that. We're going to just do a snapshot 
because I don't want your eyes crossing about midpoint, okay, glazing over. And we're going to look at how they relate to each other. They're, they're, we're not going to do, I'm not going to review them in numerical order, but we're going to show you how they, how they flow together and the tools that we use. So, but let's turn, just take a look at our service structure. It starts with us, the groups. It starts with us. We have an inverted pyramid. Then your group sends a general service representative as your voice. That person will go to monthly district meetings. And all those districts, you, it depends upon the area because every area is autonomous. Some meet three times a year, some meet four. They will gather up at area assemblies. An area is defined as a geographically designed area, and usually it's based on AA population. Most states only have one area, the, the entire state. California, six. We have so many drunks here. <laughs> Drinking and sober, um, but we have a lot of sober drunks. And we have six areas. We are the state with the largest number of areas. I think Texas has five. A lot of drunk cowboys there. And uh, there's a few states that have more than one as well. But most of them just have uh, one delegate. So they, one of their purposes every two years is to elect a new delegate. And that delegate will take a two-year term, and they will go to the General Service Conference. That conference then will give our voice to those who will carry out the duties. You see, the General Service Board, which is branched off into our two active corporations, AA World Services and the Grapevine, on the left, you'll see the various committees that each delegate is assigned to, and each board member is assigned to. So this is just our basic chart, but it, the important thing I want to say, it starts with your group sending a representative. Very, very key. In 1955, this was given, this responsibility was given to us, as I mentioned earlier, in St. Louis, and that's what leads us into the first concept. So if you'll turn your page to this handout, this is, sometimes I'm going to have, we're going to actually go into this book in a couple of times. I'm not trying to make it confusing, but I also think it's helpful if you actually open up pages and you look at it, and at least it'll be opened once. You know, if you never open your book up again, you'll open it once. So... Bear with me. I hope it'll be easy, but I want to give you some hands-on with it, too, to make it memorable. The first concept, the fellowship as a whole, is given and is to take the final responsibility and ultimate authority. But here's the question. Are we taking that role seriously? If we are supposed to send a representative, is your group? Is your group sending a representative? Personally, I would not belong to a home group that did not have an intergroup representative and a general service representative. That is our responsibility. That is our privilege to have a voice. I cannot complain about anything that might be happening if I am not taking the responsibility of showing up and having representation. If we assume that the same percentage of groups that send general service representatives is the same amount percentage of groups that financially contribute, that, that would probably be pretty reasonable. If you've got a GSR, your group's probably contributing. What that would mean, according to the 2006 numbers, is that 45.5% of the groups are making your decisions for you. Less than half of the registered groups 
support financially our general service office, then less than half of the groups are making the decisions for all of us. So be sure your group has a GSR. But when you pick that GSR, be wise. Don't be hasty. Oh, they've got seven minutes of sobriety. It'll be good for them. Let's get them out there. <laughs> well, yeah, it might be good for them, uh, but it won't be good for the group. <coughs> because you pick weak GSRs, they're going to pick weak delegates. Oh, I like that person because they're cute. You know, I'll tell you, we want the best people we can get. We want people interested and willing. And so don't be hasty when you pick that person. There is a suggestion, only a suggestion, of two years of sobriety. And I really believe that's a great guideline because at two years of sobriety, you're still on fire and you've gone through your steps, hopefully, and... <laughs> And, and you need to channel that energy, so get them into service is my, my ad, too. In concept two, you see, we now have, as a, in mass of the fellowship cannot possibly make effective decisions and manage our world services, so we delegate to the conference to be our voice, and that's our concept two. Well, we jump now to concept six in the flow because... The conference only meets once a year. They, too, cannot effectively manage and conduct our world affairs, so they delegate that authority to our board of trustees. This conference we talk about is comprised of 93 delegates, and we have our board is of 21 members. That board is comprised of seven non-alcoholics, and we call them Class A, and 21, excuse me, 14 uh, alcoholics we call Class B. B is for boozer, in my opinion. So, you know, it's easy to tell which is which. Actually, we are only operating with 20 trustees at this time. We are short one Class B. Last year, in 06, after the elections of a new regional trustee for Eastern Canada, in about four or five months, that man died. The region was asked, what do you want to do? The region, all of those provinces involved, they caucused, they said, we don't want to elect anybody to replace him right now so that we stay in the rotation and we're going to let the board, the chairman of the board of trustees, designate a fellow trustee to cover this as they see fit. And so at this time, the trustee for the western region of Canada is covering also the eastern region. So we are operating for the next few years with only 20 trustees, which is fine. Again, that's, that's, they went to the people involved, the region. Okay. Now we go down to concept eight, and because we're holding the board responsible for our affairs, they cannot carry out and manage the daily operations. Therefore, through custodial oversight, they delegate authority to our two active service boards. So it's a series of delegated authority, and that's, I think, what can be confusing a little bit, and, and that's what I wanted to just really super simplify. No mumbo-jumbo is just simply a matter of delegation of authority. And we can even see that in simple ways in, in our own group structure. You might have a steering committee, but they're accountable to the group as a whole. But they may, you know, when your group elects a secretary, you give them delegation, but they can't make the coffee and do the parking commitment. and do the, 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 So everything gets delegated out. Well, that's in another way, how you can look at what's happening here. Now, those two service boards that take care of AEWS and the grapevine, they are composed of nine members. So if you turn that next page, because we're going to come back to the, fold, the flow chart, but the next page, I've provided you with the current listing 
of your board of trustees, your clan. Now, this is, does have last names. Please respect the anonymity. Do not distribute this to non alcoholic entities or publish or any internet stuff, please can remember about their anonymity as well. But you have your seven class A's, you have your 14 or 13 class B's, but I listed all 14 regions and areas. Then you have who your officers are, your board of trustee officers. And if you turn the page, then you have your slate of the, who are the nine directors on each of the two boards. And again, we're not going to detail this, but if you want to look at it later to see how they're comprised, what the membership of that is made of, you can do that at that time. But those, that is your board and your corporate boards. Okay. And again, these trustees are not paid. Their expenses are reimbursed, but we ask a lot of their time. We ask a lot of their time. That's a huge commitment. Back to the flow chart, if you will. We're going to kind of shift to the right a little bit, and you'll see concept seven. We have two documents that guide us. The bylaws and charter are legal documents, and the general service board is responsible to those. There's also a conference charter, which is not a legal document, but is generally more powerful than the legal one, because that's guided by our traditions and our spirit of service. The board, as a whole, is legally responsible party for our finances and our business participation. These bylaws identify to the state of New York who and what we are, what we do, how we go about it, and where we do it. That conference charter was created in 1950 at that first international, but it wasn't adopted until 55 when we became, uh, when we came of age, as Bill would say. The conference charter will nearly always be superior to the power of the bylaws. Now, here's where I want to go into the book for the first time, if you will. I want to show you these documents. We're not going to read them. I want to show you where they are, what they look like, and just a, a snapshot explanation. Let's go in the, in the front half of the book. The page numbers are identified starting with an S. If you'll turn to page, it should be S90, S90, it'll, it, or roughly in maybe a page or two front or back, it'll say Appendix A, page S90. This is the original conference charter, and... The reason I want to point that out is because they felt it is imperative that we leave it as it was originally adopted. All those footnotes are the changes that have come about since, but that we never forget where we came from. And if you'll turn the page a little bit, keep turning, then you have Appendix B, which is a resolution. And this is what was adopted in 1955 in St. Louis, making the conference now replace the co-founders. Turn the page, you'll see Appendix C, current conference charter. What this basically will do, with the exception of some footnotes that they've done, is they've taken the original and they've updated it. So you're, you're not going to do, 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 you know, all the time. It's merged the changes, but we haven't forgotten where we've come from, and we can have an easily readable document of what we'd have adjusted it to. So that is your, this is your current conference charter. This is what guides us. Continuing on, you see, again, a resolution, which, again, that comprises the whole picture of the charter for our general service conference operation. And then Appendix D is your conference panels. This tells you when you elect your delegate. Now, you guys are Southern, I believe. Okay. 
So if you look, yours and my delegate are elected in the same year. So they got elected in 2006, and they both went to the conference this time for the first time. I'm northern coastal under California, and y'all are southern. Okay. And that just tells you they're different when, when the rotation is. Keep turning a couple pages, and you'll see Appendix E. These are our legal bylaws for uh, our Board of Trustees. On page 107, the first full paragraph after the steps, it says a couple sentences down, the claims no proprietary right in the recovery program for these 12 steps as all spiritual truths may now be regarded as available to all mankind. However, because these 12 steps have proven to constitute an effective spiritual basis for life, which, if followed, arrests the disease of alcoholism, they've you know, put in the terms that you can't be changing and stuff like that. We uh, contacted uh, GSO a few months ago and asking how many requests have there been. The number came back, 542 requests for our 12 steps. Lots of problems out there. <laughs> Lots of problems. But they are spiritual truths. They're not to be hoarded, but shared, but don't change our 12 steps in their nature. Okay, if we turn another couple pages, um, this is just a little kind of funny, funny quirk. Bottom of one, um, excuse me, S109, the last paragraph. There shall be 14 Class B member trustees. These Class B members, remember I said those are the alcoholics, are designated in the Certificate of Corporation as ex-alcoholic. <laughs> Only because in the common speech of man, an ex-alcoholic is an individual who at one time imbibed alcoholic beverages excessively and uncontrollably, but who does not now imbibe at all. So anyway, just a fun little thing to show you. These are the documents that guide our general service board and our conference structure. So you know where they are. you you got a kind of a, a, a touch on them. All right. Let's go back to the flow chart. Are you with me still? I'm not, am I confusing you or, okay, I'm trying to make this real clean. Okay, now we're going to talk about some of the tools that they've given us. These are provided so that we can best perform in a respectful and manageable fashion, and therefore we give each element, meaning all services structure, and this is where it gets personal. These tools are where it gets personal, things that we can apply in our personal daily lives. The first one, concept three, right of decision. This just simply means that at any level of service, each element has the right to decide what they will handle on their own, consult with others, or go back to the group for guidance and direction, and they're even allowed to make a mistake. <laughs> Again, we can go through lots of examples, but one of the easy ones I like to use is the coffee maker. If the coffee maker is given that job, is not, you know, they know what time to, they should be told what time to be there, given, give them the guidelines, how much coffee to make, how to make it. But they don't need to be hovered over. And if they are also responsible for getting more cups and they're down to four cups and there's 80 people at the meeting, they don't need to call a business meeting to go get more cups. Okay. <laughs> So they have been given the right of decision to go buy more cups because that is part of their responsibility. However, if they want to buy a caseload of cups because they're going to save a couple of bucks and there's no place to put them, that probably should be consulted with the secretary or the treasurer or somebody because that's a little outside the range of what their responsibilities are. So in a real first grade fashion, 
that's kind of an example of what we're talking about here. Stay within what your job description is, but you know, you can't use right a decision to abuse your description, job description, but be given the opportunity to do that and you don't have to should not have to check everything out. Another tool we were given is write a participation. The primary thing for that was that no one felt like a second class citizen. Let me not make anyone in my group feel like a second class member, a second class citizen. Let me make sure I may, I want people to feel that everyone is important, their voice counts, and they're, it's, we want you here, you're needed here. The voting members of that conference, I kind of mentioned or started it a little bit before, for 2006, and sometimes the number varies one or two, but it's roughly around this always. You have 93 conference delegates from the United States and Canada. You have normally 21 trustees, but this year, as I said, we had 20. And 21 members of the two corporate boards and our general service office staff. That totals 134 people. Our delegates meet yearly, our trustees quarterly, our board members usually about nine to ten times a year, and our staff is daily. Everybody's input is valuable. But regardless of how many committees are on, they only get one vote. In concept five, it probably one of my, my favorites and one that, again, is applicable everywhere is the right of appeal, like if there's a personal grievance, someone's unhappy at the, you know, they've been given, you know, uh, inappropriate amounts of work. They have the, the right to appeal that without being worried about losing their job or being fired or, you know, gum on their chair. They don't have to worry about stuff like that, okay? But also, once again, that you can't use that to not do what you're supposed to be responsible for. But the minority opinion, I think, is one of our most cherished and valued um, tools. Every voice is important. That Bill felt that the minority not only has the right to speak up, but the actual duty to present its views whenever it felt that the majority to be in considerable error, or when it saw that a grave and mistaken decision could seriously affect AA as a whole. And again, there's some examples on that. Later on, we can talk about that. But this is very, very vital. But how do we use that? Can, do we use that when we're in business meetings? Do we make sure that we hear the minority opinion before we hastily rush into a vote? Has everyone had an opportunity to speak? I mean, not that we have to have the same statement made by 14 people. I mean, you know, let's be thoughtful of that. But if you have something different to contribute or maybe that we haven't seen, it's your right and it's important that you speak up. At home, do I listen to the minority opinion? At, um, at, my, at work, do I listen to the minority opinion? What would happen if I did? How valuable that would be to feel that you were counted because you were heard, the acknowledgement of being heard. And I, I just absolutely love that concept. Another one we have is nine, and this is one we are going to talk more about, and that's about leadership. This, again, is one that all of us can use in our lives, and so we, he outlines fabulous tools for leadership. In 10, we're given the responsibility, give us the authority to fulfill it, kind of like the coffee maker. I mean, again, the coffee maker shouldn't always have to check, is it okay that I go get more cups? Give them the authority to do what they need to do so things can run and flow in a, in a manner of uh, fashion. But... If you've got more than one committee working on things, be sure that you have outlined which one is the jurisdiction. And that, of course, applies more for our general overall structure. In 11, the other tool is get the best people you can for the job. But define the structure. We define the duties in 10. We define the structure of it in 11. This will create a successful organization. Just a real, it's a long concept to read, but some of the overview points that it addresses is that our staff, our 11 uh, primary 
alcoholic staff members rotate every two years their job. If they're on PI for two years, they'll maybe rotate into literature. They also have other assignments they're given, like they'll be the correspondent for our region, for example, which is the Pacific region, or they'll be on the international committee. They rotate so that we avoid any down downtime in our um, in our um, uh, it, office breakdown at, at any time. And they are also paid an appropriate compensation comparable to the commercial work world and are given raises for time served, not for performance. So this is a little bit different, and they, they explain it more if you're interested in there, but that's just the nutshell. Some of the commonly asked questions, and you may have these too when you're looking at the structure, why don't we just merge the two corporations together? Why do we need to have two? The reason it would be too big for one person, A, also to find the person to, to handle it well, to replace the person when that time would come. But the biggest thing is that we do not want so much power and authority in one person. This has a better balance. Why don't we have the grapevine do all the publishing? They're, they're printing stuff anyway, right? Because they're two very dissimilar organizations. The grapevine has a monthly deadline, and we publish and print our books and pamphlets as needed. So this is, again, why we have two, the two corporate structures. And the other commonly asked question is, why does an AAWS just handle all the money? And once again, we talked about if you're given the responsibility, you need to also have the authority to fill it out. And they shouldn't have to go asking for money all the time. Can we go ahead, you know, and, and uh, print more, more, uh, more magazines? So we have, they've created this balance of authority and responsibility. And the last tool, Concept 12, I, I call it a tool. It's actually a summarization. It's called our... Um, Six general warranties are revolved in here, and it's, to me, it summarizes those prior 11 concepts. This is another one that we're going to look at more in depth. So you've got the 12 concepts in a nutshell. That's how they flow. These are the tools we're given. It's clear as that. <laughs> we'll go ahead and take a break now. Uh, we'll take 10 minutes. Then I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk more about Concept 9 and 12, and then we'll take your questions. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.